Mary Port. I think it has to be Mary Port. Good chance. Half past three tonight. Well, I think it's a cert tonight, lads. Mary Port, Carnival Day tomorrow. So let's see who can get the first kiss. We're going to get in on the dark. So if you four go in, you in first. You and Alan. You going to take night sights in this area? Yeah, we'll be on the motor somewhere. Here, I've got them. What do you think? Don't bother about call signs or anything, because we think we're safe enough to have it. First name basis. 1016 if you're in trouble. All right. I'm a strong believer in law and order. Coming from Northern Ireland, there's a good reason for that. I witnessed one stage of practically a total breakdown. And that appalled me to see mob rule and, and anarchy. The River Derwent itself, my main responsibility, rises in the Cumbrian Fells, and it flows westwards into the Irish Sea. It seems to me that the poachers believe that they've got a God-given right to take as many salmon as they wish. A lot of people seem to have this attitude that no one owns the fish, which is a fact. They're wild in nature and anyone could take them. But there's legislation to protect the salmon and it's my job not to dwell on the rights or wrongs of society. That's a problem for the people who go to the House of Parliament. Everybody's image and idea of the old poachers, the old chap in the long black coat and cloth cap, going out to take a salmon for the pot. And I've been a bailiff for 19 years, and I've never met him. Today's poacher, unfortunately for, for me and for the bailiffs in this area, is almost invariably a young thug. Now, that might be a bold statement. But the people that we catch taking salmon have previous convictions for ABH, GBH, burglary, whatever. And their motivation seems to be greed. The money to be made is quite high. Thousand pounds, two thousand pounds a night could be on the cards. There's been a tradition of poaching here in West Cumbria for years and long before my time and before the previous inspector's time going back before the First World War. I've had some newspaper cuttings I could show you where people were prosecuted. Still the same names are appearing as well. You know, the tradition goes through the families. Um, it's a way of life, has been a way of life in West Cumbria. And whatever I do or my bailiffs do, we won't stop it ever we can bring it to maybe almost an acceptable level, but it won't stop it. Read Brian. Brian, will you call them out? We'll meet down in the park. Some of the people that we have on now as full-time, trusted, reliable water bailiffs have been poachers in the younger days. And that's not a bad thing. Well, quite. You should, right. so, you should have been like the hell of a run of fish there. Yeah. Some yeah, beauty's going to be. It's be a bit of a loner, really, doesn't he? The person. He doesn't mind being despised, 
and hated by his former friends and people he went to school with. I've interviewed a number of people, really wanting them to come on. And when I asked the question, could you report your best friend? And then I got the answer, no way. I couldn't report any of my mates. Then he wasn't the man for the job. Really. You, know, you have to be to rise above that. You, know, you have to be a bit of a bastard, really. Well, I'll we'll give it plenty of time, so I think we'll call the day. Huh? I've done everything. I've worked in DHSS offices. I've worked in factories. I've been in Australia for a few years. And I spent some time with the Canadian fishery authorities. And the poachers there, by and large, are Indians. And they're armed. I was actually on my way back from there. We were flying to Manchester. And it was then that I had my first view of the Lake District from about 30 odd thousand feet. And I had the funniest feeling then. I, I, I can't describe it, but this view of Lakeland from the air on a crystal clear day is still with me. And it was a very short time after that that I came over into this position. I could see myself up on the bottom of your fells, looking over the lakes. And the reality of it was when I came here, I spent the first few months in Workington, and particularly on Workington docks. And it was a a very, very sobering effect on me. All the euphoria that I've experienced when I was given the post, and even going through the interview, I still hadn't a clue what I was expected to do. And the last thing I, I did expect was to be involved in what is recognised as the probably the hardest poaching area in England. And it did come as a bit of a shock when I was dropped in the deep end. Workington's at the mouth of my river, and the salmon come in there from the sea. The trouble is, if there's not enough water in the river, the fish swim into the dock by mistake and get trapped there, and they either die or get taken by poachers, which really amounts to the same thing. However, most of the fish do get upriver. I reckon they start arriving here in the first week of July. The 6th of July is a magic date to me. They jump up the weir above Workington and then they make their way to the upper reaches. That's when the anglers get their sport, but unfortunately, that's when the poachers get their sport as well. Salmon were near to being regarded as an endangered species. There were so many predators after them, but these days we manage them. We not only try to save them from poachers, but we try to increase the stock of the fish in the river. When they've reached the spawning grounds, we stun them using electricity. The fish mightn't enjoy it very much, but the lads have a great time. After one winter at sea, the salmon have grown quite a lot. They average about seven pounds then when they return. Some of them even a lot heavier than seven pounds. But with two winters at sea, they can come back as quite splendid fish, 15, 20 pounds plus. They're in great nick. They're just really solid muscle then. When we've caught them, we inject them with antibiotics. That's to try and compensate for the damage that inevitably results in the capture. It guards them against infection. I'll just give it back. We store the salmon until they've got over their trauma of being captured and to ripen them up as well. And once they're ripe, then we're ready for a spot of what's really an artificial insemination. We take the red roe from the females, from the henfish, and then we take the milt from the cockfish and mix that to allow fertilization to take place. I would say I'm the father of 